Sticking with our CES coverage, I want to bring on our AI and robotics reporter, Rocket Drew, to help us dig a bit deeper into Alpha Mayo, the self-driving car model that NVIDIA unveiled yesterday. He wrote about that in our AI Agenda newsletter out today. Rocket, welcome back to the show. It's great to have you here. Hey, Akash. It's great to be back. So we just talked about the chips that NVIDIA unveiled or gave us more details on. I want you to explain to us what exactly Alpha Mayo one is because it's alpha mayo one that's right <laughs> and what, what is this model supposed to do yeah it's a model for self-driving cars so it's trained on a bunch of data that people have collected by driving their cars in the real world and then a lot of data besides that that's sort of generated in computer simulations uh, using nvidia's own computer simulation technology in particular using cosmos which is their sort of um mainline AI world model. Um, and the model is intended to drive cars. It can predict what action a car should take based on a state of the road, based on an input image. Um, the model itself is like, a, it's pretty big. So if anyone was going to use it in practice, you'd typically customize it a bit on your own data. Maybe you distill it into a model that's smaller and faster so it can run uh, in the car itself. But it's intended to accelerate the development of self-driving technology in a number of ways. And so how does this model compare against other self-driving car models? I mean, we know that Tesla is working on uh, their own robo-taxi um, suite of, of cars, I guess. I mean, presumably they have their own model. I don't even know. Is this a very competitive landscape? You know, I think a lot of it's locked down and very proprietary. So it's difficult to say what Tesla is doing. I mean, Tesla has made a pretty firm position that they're interested in using camera inputs only. So um, they want their car to be able to maneuver the world solely based on vision rather than using additional sensors like um, LIDAR to estimate how far away different objects are. Uh, and then the biggest difference, I think, is that this model is... Um, it's open source, so anyone can download it, anyone can tinker with it and experiment and customize it, uh, and that makes a big difference for the model. It's also not intended to provide you know, so-called level four autonomy right out of the box. The intention isn't that you can put this in your car tomorrow and you can stay home while your car drives around for you. you know, uh, At best, as they're starting to roll this out, I'm working with Mercedes-Benz, it's going to hit the road at level two autonomy, which means- And the, the difference, right, the difference between like two and four is it, it can tweak your uh, steering and your acceleration speeding up and slowing down but you've got to be vigilant the whole time you've got to be ready to take over and take the wheel if anything goes wrong got it so you you wrote about this being uh, an end-to-end -end model what what does that mean that's right so the traditional approach in a lot of robotics, including for self-driving cars, is you have specialized pieces of software that are governing everything the robot, or in this case, the self-driving car needs to do, from perceiving the world and making sense of it, to planning what actions to take, to controlling the robot or the car in taking those actions. And you'd have a separate layer of software that handles each of those. That has some really nice properties. Like, you can tell when something's going wrong, I know it's going wrong with the perception part of this process. And you can see the flow of information from one to the other. But with the rise of AI, it's very in vogue these days to just have a single a unitary AI model that from pixels coming in to actions coming out controls everything that the robot or the car does. And that has some really some real advantages because you know AI models are so uh, expressive and powerful. They can capture all of these difficult to define rules and they can learn from data in subtle ways. On the other hand, now you're letting a, some black box that you can't really monitor, that isn't very transparent, control your car. And, and that's a very high stakes kind of robotics, right? That's a very serious deployment. So, um, And you, and you, you don't actually, if something goes wrong, you don't know what part of it actually went wrong because it's not as segmented. Exactly. Exactly. And something, you know, it's always going to encounter some scenario it's never seen before. You're always going to come across something on the road that your model didn't see during training. And you want to make sure that it's going to be able yeah. to properly do you want to share the example that you that you gave in your newsletter i had i had santa con on the mind i'm thinking you know if one of these self-driving a parade cars... of drunken santas <laughs> is the obstacle that rocket decided he was that's gonna that's right you, he you was gonna put in front of the training data you know <laughs> you know yeah. that uh, nvidia isn't simulating those drunken santas during training right so 
I mean, I, I do want to ask you though, I mean, so there are pros and cons. Why do you think NVIDIA went with that end-to-end -end approach then? Was it really just a way to differentiate itself? Um, is it a way, is it a business decision? I mean, yeah. you're saying it's open source. So, I mean, presumably there's a lot more there that people can tinker with. I mean, I walk me through. Yeah, I think it really showcases their simulation software. I think that's really how you get a lot of juice out of this Cosmos model that they've put out, and they're trying to drive adoption of it. And then uh, I think they want people to spend compute. Uh, to Steve's point earlier, um, NVIDIA wants people to spend compute on actually running this model, and I think that makes most sense in this kind of end-to-end -end, um, paradigm as well. But NVIDIA does something clever, right? They don't just rely, when they're actually putting this model out into the world, when they're working with Mercedes, they're not relying just on the end-to-end -end model. In parallel, they're running the more traditional stack of perception and planning and action. And they're both systems at the same time are deciding what action should we take. And they have sort of, um, what do they call it, like a safety policy evaluator on top. It is a fancy way to say they have another system that's deciding at any given moment, which one should we listen to? Do we hmm. trust what the black box model so, so is? It, it decides. You it either decides. go with the new model or the old, or the old older right, technology. Right, based on how confident the models are, based on uh, are we in a novel scenario that the model hasn't anticipated? And that adds a level of, of safety to it because you can guarantee that we'll fall back on the, the safer model in the event that we run into some exceptional circumstance. All right. I want to shift to talking about another scoop that you published today. Uh, you and Katie Roof, our Deputy Bureau Chief of Venture Capital, had a story about LM Arena, and uh, I, I gave it away here in the heading, but <laughs> the reporting showed that it's valued at $1.7 billion in a new funding round. Tell us a little bit more about why the LM Arena was able to raise all this money. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Alam Arena has become a go-to place to compare the capabilities and performance of models. Uh, I can tell you I talk to uh, people in AI all the time that look to Alam Arena for a sense of how different models are performing to gauge the quality of new releases. Um, it's really become a, a source of common knowledge for how different models perform at different tasks, from answering questions to generating images to generating videos from images, like you name it, Alam Arena is creating a category to compare models. How does it make money? So it has a, a, a small army of people who for free are comparing models around the world and telling you, you know, ChatGPT is doing this and Claude is doing that. That data that El Marina collects is really valuable. I mean, that's a super valuable signal for AI companies to use to improve their models. So El Marina works with AI companies, both the model developers and bigger businesses that are working on uh, deploying these AI systems, and it gives them custom evaluations. Like a company comes to them and says, you know, we want to know how well it's doing at a certain category. And thanks to El Marina's um, the data that they've collected and thanks to the sort of free workforce that they have, they're able to provide uh, really, you know, sort of useful evaluation metrics and compare. They can tell you ahead of time, this is how your model is going to stack up. So you... it's basically the, I mean, it, it has this public uh, benchmarking system for the public to see, but then privately, it, you know, it can get paid by these labs to basically give feedback on exactly. how, how good their models are. Exactly. And, and, you know, there, I imagine there's like a wall between the two and saying, hey, the feedback that we give, you know, like, we, we're like, they'd have to really say, we're not picking favorites, right? And, you know, we're, we're closer to this lab and this lab, we have more business from this lab, and it, it would really have to be a wall in yeah. saying, we don't, uh, we don't mix the two. Yeah, you know, and they've come under some criticism for the practices related to this in the past. There was a paper that was published a while ago um, that was headed up by Cohere, and Cohere was criticizing that it seemed like Meta, in the um, in advance of releasing one of its Llama models, was able to sort of pay to play. And I think the way you're you're pointing to, they could submit a number of checkpoints for the model that were customized in different ways. They could see which one performed the best, and then they could go with that one. So on the day the model comes out, it seems like it's performing very well against the others. Um, now, El Marina has, has responded to this extensively and has explained their practices and, and how they go about it. But you also might say, um, you know, what's the harm? You could say, well, sure, Meta is willing to pay more than other customers, but the feedback they're getting, if it's high quality, is leading to the best version of Llama that they could possibly release. So um, that's a position you could have on it as well. Right. Well, Rocket, I want to thank you for coming on. That is 
Rocket Drew, our AI and robotics reporter here at The Information.